Hi there, I'm Eric Holman, District Wildlife Biologist for WDFW, and we're here on uh, the mud flow unit of the St. Helens Wildlife Area today. And we're here today because uh, one of the study animals associated with our elk hoof disease investigation has died. We've received an email notification and a GPS location of where the elk is. So we're here today to investigate why the animal's dead and collect a variety of samples from the animal. And so we're gonna do a field necropsy on this animal today, collect those samples, see what we can do by way of uh, ascertaining why the animal's dead. Okay, so like I mentioned before, this elk is part of what we call a survival study related to trying to learn more about the effects that this disease has on both the individual elk and the overall elk population. And in the broad sense, what we're looking to understand is how the elk that have hoof disease compare to healthy elk living in the same landscape on some basic biological functions. And those are survival, body condition, pregnancy rate, and their ability to raise a calf. Uh, if we know those uh, biological indexes, it allows us to manage the elk population even while this disease is present and speaks to ultimate management decisions that we might need to make uh, based on uh, what we've learned from them. If you come in with me here, you can see that she is identified as elk number 307. <clears throat> and so each elk has an individual identifier. She's also wearing this collar, which uh, does two things. It has a traditional VHF frequency, so you can find it with uh, what's called radio telemetry. It also does uh, GPS locations to satellites. And it, as I mentioned before, it tells us when the animal has died. And so we've been notified that this one has died and we're here today to collect our samples and learn what we can from this animal's death. And we'll be showing you some more of that as we take this animal apart. Hey everyone, my name is Kyle Garrison. I work for the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And as Eric was uh, mentioning earlier, uh, this elk here is part of a larger study on elk hoof disease, or what we now know as treponeme-associated hoof disease. Uh, unfortunately, this disease appeared about a decade ago. We had a really dramatic rise in the disease's occurrence. We know that it's a form of digital dermatitis, which is a disease that's very common in the cattle industry, particularly dairy cattle. It, Pathogens themselves affect the hoof tissues of elk. This elk has elk hoof disease, you can see here. Characteristically, it causes deformed hooves, broken hoof claws, and lesions in the hoof tissues, in this interdigital space and surrounding the hoof in general. In its most severe forms, this disease can cause this entire hoof claw to slough off, and the animal is left with an open wound, uh, sort of a club like uh, structure that can occasionally heal over, um, but unfortunately it's very debilitating for the animals. Uh, while Eric begins this by taking off the collar and getting this ear tag, uh, I'll give you a little bit more background information on elk hoof disease. So we're here again in the mud flow unit, the Mount St. Helens wildlife area, low elevation, uh, Cowlitz County. This is one of the areas where the disease is most prevalent. It's also very prevalent in Wakayakum and western Lewis County, but really broadly in southwestern Washington uh, overall. Uh, at, at different levels of prevalence. We also know the disease is pre present in the northwestern uh, section of the state in the Skagit Valley. Um, this disease is most commonly observed in these low elevation uh, areas, uh, again here in southwestern Washington, uh, very wet conditions throughout the year and that's where you see the disease most prevalent and that's where you also see this type of disease, digital dermatitis, in domestic livestock situations where um, the microbes, the pathogens which cause this disease uh, really uh, do really well in these wet, sloppy, anaerobic conditions in a domestic livestock scenario and unfortunately also here in the lower elevation areas of southwestern Washington and in western Washington and other areas. So this disease predominantly it's affecting the hind feet of elk uh, the, the, the hoof tissues on the back legs and also uh, affects males, females and can affect the very young and also the very old so um, all, all members of, of elk are equally susceptible to this disease it appears and uh, as soon as Eric wraps up here we'll start uh, getting more into the necropsy and showing you a little bit more about what we're learning from this individual. We'll take this thing back and get the data off of it 
and turn it off and next December we'll go catch some more elk and, uh, and, and this collar can be used to, to learn about another one. Okay, we're back here um, with elk 307. We've just started our necropsy, uh, collecting samples from this elk to understand why it died. So what we've done here is remove the hooves. And we do this, we send these hooves to a collaborator at Colorado State University. And there they do a lot of testing and some lab research to try to understand more about how this disease is initiated and how it progresses in elk. Uh, and ultimately help us learn more about you know, how this disease came about and, and what we can do to try to manage this disease better and understand it better. So these are the front hooves. As you see, these are normal looking hooves. I mentioned earlier, this disease predominantly affects the hind hooves, although it does uh, affect front hoof tissues as well, but not in this elk. It doesn't appear that it's it got an infection there. So we bag these right front. Okay, right front. Separately. We keep track of them so they know what what hoof is what at the lab. So front left. Okay. Okay, so now we have the hind hooves here. And this is the right hind hoof. You can see very obviously deformed uh, and, and very different than this, this healthy left hind foot. Um, so we can see We've got overgrowth of the hoof claw, uh, both of these hoof claws um, caused by damage that this infection, uh, the hoof naturally responds and, and grows uh, abnormally. When we look underneath, we see quite a bit of damage here to the hoof tissues. Again, this being a, a normal hoof. You see here, we've got the overgrowth. And we've got a lot of cavitation and decay of these internal hoof tissues here. Um, this is really what's causing these animals to, to limp around. Uh, when it gets to this stage, we call this stage a, a grade three, give or take. Uh, and so we'll look back over and you can see here on the interdigital space, which is very commonly affected for on, on digital dermatitis and domestic livestock. This looks pretty normal. The lab testing will show whether or not this is a very early stage of the disease. But you can see here, we've got quite a bit of damage uh, lesions and infection going on here in the interdigital space. So very clearly diseased uh, and a very characteristic case of elk hoof disease. So we'll go ahead and we'll bag these up. And once we're done here, we're going to start uh, getting more into this elk and collecting some more uh, uh, biological samples to help us understand why this animal died. Okay, so as you can see, we've removed the skin from one side of the elk and that allows us to begin to get in here and get out some of the other tissues and organs that we're gonna, gonna remove from this animal to do some further sampling. We've also skinned out the neck to be able to look at, uh, just to investigate the possibility that she could have been taken by a predator. Uh, we don't have wolves in this part of the state yet, so the pro a predominant predator on adult elk is cougars, and so if a cougar had killed this animal, we'd be able to see evidence of trauma bite marks uh, where the cougar had attacked uh, this elk and and uh, predated on it. We don't see that in this case as we expected. This animal probably has just died of a complication of being in very poor condition and the hoof disease. So we're going to uh, further rule out any uh, thought that perhaps she was preyed on by a cougar. Okay, moving a little bit further uh, downward in the animal. We're going to go after a couple of different lymph nodes. And of course the lymph nodes, uh, just like in people, are part of the lymphatic system. That's uh, how your body is able to fight disease and infection. And therefore collecting these different lymph nodes from the elk allow our veterinary partners to uh, further their investigation and, and look for uh, uh, agents of immune response and, and that might demonstrate this animal is fighting off an infection. So. The first uh, lymph node uh, that we find, that we're after, uh, is located right here. This one's called prescapular. The scapula is here under the shoulder blade. Pre means forward of it. And so we'll just take a couple slices. And this tissue here is the prescapular lymph node. We're going to pop it into formalin and send it off to our partners at Colorado State. And we'll go to the back of the elk and get another lymph node. That is located in the flesh of the hind leg and I had it once it's right here and this one's called the popliteal lymph node ok 
Okay, there it is in a jar of formalin so our partners know which one it is. Okay, we're proceeding with our necropsy. You can see here that we've removed this front leg and shoulder. For those of you that do big game hunting, that will look a little bit to you like the gutless method of cleaning a big game animal. Although we take it a step further. After that leg's off, we've gone and carefully cut around these ribs and then used a set of loppers to remove the ribs, take those out of our way so we're able to get in here and see some of the initial internal organs that we're going to go after in our, as we proceed through our necropsy. Uh, the first uh, ones of those is going to be the lungs. And the lungs, of course, uh, sometimes can harbor pneumonia. We do have a situation in some of these elk where the, we've diagnosed that they've had uh, pneumonia. And so, again, our veterinary partners will be looking for that as we send them these samples. And uh, you might remember from school this trick of using kind of a mnemonic device to remember uh, which uh, sequence of things belong to which name. So the lungs are divided into four lobes for the purpose that we're uh, using here today. And uh, maybe it's silly, but what I've come up with is that the forward one is red, that's closest to the head. Green is moss for moss back. White is white for white butt or wapiti, which is Shoshone for elk. And then yellow is uh, closest to the guts, closest to the belly. So I'll proceed and get samples from each of those sections of the lungs. We label them with these different colored zip ties. So our cooperators know which section of the animal that came from uh, when they do their work on it in the lab. Okay, you can see now that I've removed the elk's heart and we're going to collect samples of the heart and send it off to the lab as well. Uh, but while we have the heart in hand here, we're going to look at a couple of uh, uh, things that give us a further indication of the elk's body condition. That's the level of body fat that she was carrying. And we're going to do that by looking at the pericardium, which is this uh, tissue, this uh, sort of bag-like structure that surrounds the heart and then we're going to open it up and look at the heart itself. So uh, outwardly this pericardium does not have much fat on it. Uh, if this was an animal in excellent condition you'd see kind of globules of, of fat kind of strung together on the on the pericardium and so now I'll remove that and we'll look at the heart itself. A little bit slick and there we see uh, this elk's heart and you can see that um, if you've looked at a few of these you can tell what kind of condition the animal is in this one doesn't really exhibit any layering of fat over the heart uh, in a nice healthy animal we would see a belt of, of yellowish hardened fat that would sort of look like a like a stick of butter across here and then in these veins that travel down the exterior of the heart and even extending onto the heart tip we would see whitening or, or a yellow layer of fat over over that if, if the elk was in good condition. Of course it's not uncommon for them to be in poor condition this time of year. They're at the end of their nutritional cycle. They've taken on condition and gained, gained food last summer and fall, last spring. Uh, but they're, they're burning through that energy that they were able to claim from the landscape last year and during the winter they're using up those reserves, burning up that fat and this time of year we're here on the 5th of April they're really at their lowest nutritional point in their annual cycle and so not uncommon to see them with low levels of fat this one has though almost none and uh, that doesn't work, that's too low so we'll get our samples from the heart and uh, continue Okay, the next piece of interest that we're after here is going to be the spleen. Spleen is this uh, kind of purplish organ that sort of folds over uh, uh, some of the other internal organs kind of along the, the back. And it's similar to the lymph system like we talked about, the spleen has a function in disease response. And so uh, that's why the veterinarians uh, want us to get a piece of that one. So I'll grab a piece of the spleen. Okay, continuing on, we've further opened up the animal and we're going to go after some different uh, parts of some more organs. Uh, next one I'll grab is uh, sections of the liver here. And uh, the liver has a function in both nutrition and disease filtration, uh, sorry, toxin filtration. And so we need sections of that that we'll collect both in our formalin for shipment to uh, Colorado State University and frozen samples that we'll save. Uh, for future analysis. So on the neck here you see that I've removed a kidney. <clears throat> Similar to the heart, the kidney is a good indicator of what kind of condition the animal's in. In a nice healthy animal, this kidney will be 
completely buried in a heavy waxy layer of of good looking fat uh, similar to the heart for in the case of elk 307 here basically no fat surrounding this kidney um, we then combine uh, these visual scores that I'm kind of taking in my mind uh, and combine the score for the pericardium the heart and the kidney into what rolls up into a thing called a Kistner score uh, and that is basically how much body fat this animal is carrying um, we know that elk that are below about 6% body fat almost never get pregnant. Elk that are in the range of between about 6 and 9 have impacted levels of pregnancy. Some of those get pregnant, some don't. When they're over about 9%, they're going to ovulate. They should get pregnant. That's during September. And uh, so we know that that body condition and these fat scores, body condition scores, are very relevant to how the elk is doing in its uh, greater role of contributing to the overall elk population and, and making more elk. And so that's part of why we're so interested in the body condition of these animals. Okay, we're nearing the end of the necropsy here for elk number 307 from the uh, hoof disease survival study here in the Mount St. Helens wildlife area and wanted to show you kind of the final sample that we're collecting today. You can see that this elk was pregnant with a calf. Uh, the calf is also a female. We actually knew this elk was pregnant from when we captured her back in December uh, from some lab work done on her blood, so not surprised to find a, a fetus uh, within this elk. Um, this one would have been born seven or eight weeks from now, right around the 1st of June. Uh, today's the 5th of April. Um, this really kind of speaks to exactly why we're out here studying the, the effects of hoof disease on this elk population. Both these elk are female and neither one of them are going to be contributing to the overall population of the St. Helens elk herd anymore. That kind of concludes our necropsy. Okay, we've concluded our necropsy. We've collected all our samples and we're ready to hike out and uh, get this stuff off in the mail to our cooperators. I wanted to take a moment to thank you for joining us for a chance to see what we do here at WDFW to manage wildlife, especially in this case to better understand the effects of elk hoof disease in southwest Washington. And uh, so thanks for your interest in natural resources in Washington State, especially wildlife. For those of you who'd like to know more about elk hoof disease and what Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife is doing to understand the disease, visit our website at wdfw.wa.gov. Thanks. Thanks.